audience. It was really um, a gift to me to watch it with you because you were you were in it. Um, so I want to call to the stage the wonderful um, people who helped make this film we're still here. Um, my unbelievable co produ unbelievable producer. So I was going co producer producer Marilyn Ness. that's in this festival in her spare time, Trapped, um, and is going on to make her own film as a director as soon as we leave this festival. Uh, and then my co-producer, my incredible co-producer, Danielle Varga, um, who is Trapped got in like, as soon as possible into Sundance, and so Marilyn was like sucked into a whirlwind, and Danielle stepped up and produced this film uh, to its completion, which was a miracle. Um, and then I really want to recognize today um, Bertha Foundation that um, Becky and Tony, um, who put money in when very few people would put money into this film, which was miraculous. And I also, I mean, I think many of you, I'm really surprised how many people are here today, and I think many of you are here today because of the press this film has gotten. And I have to say, it really wouldn't have been possible without the genius of Ryan Warner at Synetic and the dedication of Genevieve Jacobson. Um, and I want to thank her especially and Shane also for the incredible work they are doing to bring this film that was made by a handful of people out into the world. Um, and I also today um, want to call up on the stage one of um, my dear um, colleagues and uh, somebody who I met as a PA on Fahrenheit 9-11 and she's now one of the best camera people in the business and I've discussed a lot of this with her over the years, um, Nadia Hallgren, I would love to come up. And um, because, you know, I just, as we all know, uh, we who do this work and love this work, we talk about it a lot. And it's through, you know, talking together that we figure these things out. Um, so I'm going to open the house to the questions, Lauren. Sure. sure, I'll start with the first question. How did it feel to go back through all those years of footage as you were making this film? Um, well, this film started because uh, a young woman who I had filmed in Afghanistan for several years um, wisely withdrew her permission to have her face shown in the film because the landscape in which we're all living has changed so radically, you know. 25 years ago when I started making documentaries, we could film a girl in Afghanistan and promise that uh, that footage would never go back to her village and she'd never get in trouble for saying yes to being filmed. And that's over. Um, but it took the, those of us who make documentaries, and I think we're still catching up to it, uh, since you know, YouTube, 2005, cell phones everywhere all over the world, we're starting to realize the implications of this new world that we live in, and that matters both to the people in front of the camera and the people behind the camera, right? So with Laura on Citizen Four, uh, she wondered whether she could come back to the United States. I've got a friend from Pakistan, Egypt, Syria, and China, uh, Nan Fu Wang of Hooligan Sparrow, who don't know if they can go back to their own country because of a film that they've made. So this is a whole new landscape that we haven't yet explored. and. So when that happened to me and the girl pulled herself out of it, I started thinking back to other moments where I had questions about what I had done. And um, obviously the first footage that came to mind was the footage from Nigeria. And um, when that footage came in, it was really devastating to me. It was so much more traumatic than I realized. And I realized I sort of blocked the whole experience with the blurry face of that midwife. And that's how I had protected my brain from what I had been through, but I knew, I, I always thought of that baby um, for years. And so once I went back and looked at that, you know, it was really shocking to realize how long we'd filmed the baby, how much had gone on. Um, and it made me curious to see the, the distance between my memory and what was in the footage. Um, yeah. Thank you. A question Can I say one thing? Oh, yes. I just want to say, to Kirsten, you know, I think so many of us would never have the courage to just go to the places that you go to so that you can bring back a piece of the world we need to see. And then sitting next to you today, to have the courage to go through these things. And I know how hard it is to watch that baby. Mm -hmm. I felt it as I sat next to you, mm -hmm. but you brought it out to us so we could stop and think about the things that we see in film and not just let it pass by, but really stop and ponder it. Um, and then to have the courage to put it up on a screen so that people may judge you. 
I hope celebrate you, but certainly applaud you, me. I applaud you for having the courage to do all of it. So just for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the amazing thing that, you know, um, Merritt, we were talking about what does a creative producer do, uh, what's the work, and Marilyn's got this great metaphor is that she, she lays track in front of a train that's hurtling towards her. And sometimes it's a high-speed track, and she's just laying the track so that the train can keep on. But sometimes the train needs to stop because it's going to run out of fuel before it makes it to the end. And um, after I, you know, there was a time when this film was virtually all it was was, was Afghanistan and the baby scene. I mean, I had like 40 minutes of watching that baby struggle for its life. I mean, you guys thought that was hard? Like, you got off easy. Um, but, but for me, it was sort of the tip of the iceberg because I had spent a day and a night filming that baby. So I was like, what's 40 minutes? You know, why can't I put four genocides and, you know, three rape testimonies and a baby dying into a movie? And then we watched it, and Marilyn watched it <laughs> like this. And it was really clear, we can't make that movie. And at that point, Marilyn said, stop get some perspective. And I really had to look at myself and figure out like, wow, I, I've worked on this for months and I had no idea how traumatic it was. So I had to get some perspective and my editor, um, who had worked with all that baby footage, got pregnant. And so I had to search for another editor um, and I searched eight months because I knew how difficult this film was to make and it was very starting to be very clear that I could never get the voiceover right. I could never give enough context to make any of this make sense. Um, and we were starting to notice that it was in the footage. Um, so we found the extraordinary Nils Bankerter, who is deeply responsible for the form of this film. Uh, and we worked with him and uh, we, we said, okay, maybe we can work without, without voiceover. Any questions? Over here. Uh, yeah, did, go making, ahead. did making the film uh, allow you to let go of any of the sort of more mm -hmm. traumatic well, um, maybe I'll let Danny. Danny, why don't you tell the story of us watching the first rough cut? Um, so uh, it was the three of us yeah. on a Skype session in our little office. Um, so, so this was uh, this was after the period where Nels came on and suddenly, uh, you know, he had spent some time with the footage, uh, and actually, uh, Kirsten gave Nels the footage without all of the context, without all the stories, and he just was handed off um, all of her you know, experience through the footage and uh, cut something and it was totally different. It wasn't the trauma cut as, as, they, as they had referred to it. And um, it was a 40 minutes long cut. It's very similar in form, but um, but very different. And it's a lot of what you see here is uh, was in that first cut. And the lights came on and Kirsten was in tears because, well, Marilyn will say this too, but um, uh, Net, this new cut, this new version, uh, uh, and the process, I think, of going through it was able to give back Kirsten all of the joy that she also had experienced um, in, as a cinematographer, as a camera person. And so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, to answer for Kirsten, I think it did, and I think it probably still does. We were just, we were just at a Salt Lake uh, City screening last night, and we were talking afterwards, and Kirsten's like, I think, you know, I think this is like, I think I'm moving, you know, I think these are all experiences, and I think it, it is a journey. Um, yeah. And can we just say, crazy entanglement, the theater manager in Salt Lake City had one blind eye. Yeah. I was like, we're in the zone, people. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just wondering what the process was of gathering this footage from all the filmmakers you've worked with, and... Mm if they were cooperative or if there was anyone who didn't want their footage to be involved? Yeah, it was a super interesting process because some of the filmmakers are like my best friends. I talk to them all the time. I've made multiple films with them. They knew I was going through this process and they're like, you know, Ginny, Redeker, and Abby just handed over everything from Woman, War, and Peace and I went to WNET and just got, you know, hundreds of hours of footage, no problem. And then there are other people who I had spoken to in years um, and you know, I was really um, nervous about reaching out to some people because, you know, a film is such a delicate, precious thing, and a filmmaker has a responsibility to the people in the film. And I knew how challenging certain situations had been. And, and also, I mean, one of the things that I want to explore is like when you show up with a camera, you show up with some form of a promise to people that you're going to tell their story, or that maybe this film will make change in their world. And you know, some of the films I've worked on have made change in the world, and others, you know, 
mm, we can't measure what they have done. And some have done damage. And that range meant that going back to um, filmmakers was challenging. I mean, I think what's really interesting for me is that the films that really marked me, like Two Towns of Jasper and like the Nigeria footage, we really needed to talk about what it meant to use this footage again. So I had long, beautiful conversations mm -hmm. with Whitney and Marco, um, and also with Don Shapiro. Um, and, and it was clear to me that all of us still had a huge amount of unprocessed feelings about what this material was. Um, but I'm really happy to report that I you know, reached out to um, about 50 people that I worked with, and everybody agreed to let me use their footage. And um, we've got you know footage from over 30 films in this film, so it's really gratifying to me to know that that conversation was possible. Hello, sunshine. <laughs> um, I just loved it. I got involved in all the people that I saw and wanted to know what happened with them. Mm. Um, Story of my life. She got involved with all the people that she saw and wanted to know what happened to them. Welcome to my life. Um, I have a small question, but has, has the equipment that you've used over the years changed at all? Um, uh, yeah, the equipment that I've used over the years, and that was one thing we, cons you know, we just the other when we watched the film, we were like, maybe we should have put the camera that I shot it on in between, you know, instead of the places. But um, I always say when people ask me like, what's that shot? And it's always about the person who's holding the camera is how stuff looks, you know? And, and the technology has changed radically. Sadly for me, almost all my career was on standard definition video with incorporated zoom. So I was shooting on all kinds of, you know, from a big beta cam for Fahrenheit 9-11 through to teeny tiny PD-150s and now back out to the other side where I'm shooting on, you know, a Canon C300 or an FS7 um, that shoots at 4K, you know, really high definition digital, and that's going to change as my career goes on. Um, but it's all about, you know, the presence of the person. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about how you think about your own subjectivity influencing the realities around you. Yeah, no, I mean, I think um, I was searching, I mean, why we picked this, you know, someone said to me, oh, did you relate to this Bosnian family more than anybody else? And I was like, Absolutely not. I, there were so many people I related to, but there was no evidence in the footage of it. You know, in a certain that that was enough of a story to, to lay it out in terms of my own subjectivity. But um, I hope to include enough elements that you understand many of the places that I am coming from when I work, and that you can see what I'm interested in. You know, I mean, I do think it's really clear to me when I see this film. It's like you see women's work in this film uh, that you don't always see in films, right? Um, you know, you see it. And, and, you know, there's things like that, like, oh, that's a person chopping the wood and giving the fire stick and bread made. And, you know, all those sort of steps are things that often get left out of things. Um, you know, which is why I went to Afghanistan in the first place, because only women can film women in Afghanistan, right? Otherwise, they're not even seen at all, um, which has been a lot of my experience um, as a camera person. I see that Nadia Hallgren snuck back in. You were called up earlier, young lady. So I think you need to get up here. <laughs> so this is Nadia, um, who I met as a PA on Fahrenheit 9-11. And um, she was really exceptional. And uh, you know, I would, she would bring water for me. And after the shoot, um, come, she, she, um, she wrote me a letter and said, I'm really interested in how you became a camera person. Can I take you out to lunch? Um, and she did, and now she's a camera person. And this, you know, like I just um, wanted to thank you publicly, Nadia, for um, the conversations that we've had over the years and the way in which you have enlightened this film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I met Kristen 13 years ago. I was her PA, and uh, I told her I wanted to be a cinematographer, and I admired her work so much. Not only that she was great at capturing beautiful images, but just the way she connected with people and how much respect and love she showed everyone. And I knew that's the type of person that I wanted to be, so uh, she's been mentoring me ever since. A lifelong, wonderful relationship, and I uh, could be more proud of her and her film. She's, uh, I'm no mentor anymore, I can tell you that much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm just kind of wondering about what you said at the beginning of the film, mm -hmm. how you kind of didn't really know what it was going to look like, and you had ideas. Mm -hmm. and like, kind of what were the main ideas that you used to mm -hmm. pull out the footage and 
How yeah. Those change? Yeah. Great question. I mean, so I had these I had these particular places and people that you know had stayed with me and really mattered to me. So I went back and specifically got that footage. I was also interested very clearly in ideas of sort of race and representation. Um, I was interested in how you uh, film other people's pain or other people's loss. Um, uh, you know, how do you give people, uh, like how do you let people express their own agency or how do you shut down their agency? Um, all of those things are really interesting questions for me and also sort of this notion of the un unintended consequences of being there with the camera. Um, so those are all themes for me. Um, what we see, what, we're what we see, to see, what we look at, and what we're allowed to see, what we look at, and also what's invisible. You know, like to go to all of those sites in the world where such horrific things have happened, and how can I film it in any way that it translates anything about what's happened there? Um, so, you know, I had no shortage of themes, I can tell you. <laughs> and every time I wrote a proposal, people were like, "Less, we need less in this film," and I was like, "No." I want to tell you what it's like to be me, like what it's like to have gone to 86 countries and what it's like to forget where I was last week, even though it was Myanmar, because today I'm in Jasper. You know, like I wanted to share that experience of the accumulation. I think that's all we have time for. Best this question is, asked in the business. Okay. <laughs> all right, it's good. Ask one question. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. I want to tell you what it's like to watch it. Because the, many, many of us have seen most of the films. And you see a lot of movies, you see a lot of documentaries, and you forget. And so what you've done by this memoir, in the, in the form that it should be, is that you also make us be there with you. The only things I hadn't, that I can think of at the moment that I hadn't seen was your mom. It's the only time that I think that it becomes not the subject, but it becomes you in the film. And I wanted to know how you made that choice to put her in. Um, yeah, so he's just saying that, um, you know, he's seen almost all of these films that I've shot and, that, and, and he's forgotten them all, which I think we're all experiencing this incredible oversaturation of images, right? And how do we retain this incredibly emotionally intense stuff and where does it go in us, right? And he's asking me about my question. The question is to why, why did I include my mother? Um, you know, I mean, I think it's this powerful thing. Uh, the closer you are to people, the more responsibility you feel to them. And how do you how do you manage that? And how, you know, my mother never would have wanted. She never wanted to be filmed by me, and she absolutely never would have wanted to be filmed in the state she is in here. So it is a betrayal of my mother, and it is also an acknowledgement of my love for my mother and also my love of cinematography and what it can preserve for us, the way that it can save history for us and make people become alive again. You know, that's the magic that we live for. And um, so that's part of why. Um, but I can tell you there was nothing like being at Skywalker and that moment where she gets blown over by the wind and this incredible mixer, Peter Horner just kept getting the wind stronger and stronger and I just watched my mom being blown away into death over and over again and it was just, Profound experience for me. Thank you, everyone, for sharing this. <laughs>